we stared out into existence and saw a world we could conquer. We could hear the glory echo ahead and we would chase it together. History was forged to the beat of his hooves. You made nobility out of ordinary men, carried status. You diminished distances and took us further. Our world became smaller as you made us bigger. You would plow revolutions, turn soil into gold. You were the backbone to our civilizations. Everyone would worship you, continue your legacy. Did they forget who you really are? I'm Lyle Hewitson. I've been riding as a professional apprentice for short of three years now. Um, this uh, past season, 2017-2018, I was crowned champion apprentice and champion jockey of South Africa. It's just been something I've, I've grown up with. From about 13, I started riding track work. I loved it, every minute of it. It's just a feel for horses. I think it was something that I always had in my blood. I'm a professional jockey. I've started uh, uh, being a jockey since 2000 and, uh, 2001, and uh, you know, I qualified uh, 2006, and just never looked back since. I think it took me six months to, to really uh, get my fears away from riding the horse. I was a small boy coming from a, a location. I've never seen a horse before or never been near one. I went for uh, interviews, they accepted me. And from then onwards, you know, it was uh, getting into the academy. I went to school as usual through high school at Kersney College. Um, and I carried on writing work and in the back of my mind, would I be able to make a career of it? <laughs> Mr. McCalvin told me there was lots of rain at the wall. Yeah, the guys are saying now. I had like 20 messages this morning if they can come to work. I was like, that hasn't rained much yet. I always want to prove to myself that I can do it and um, that I've got the ability and I must trust in myself. So I am very self-motivated, but you know, it might sound cliche, but I, I really try to um, make my family and friends proud and make the important people in my life proud of, of what I've achieved. My name, Philip, actually means lover of horses, so I had no choice with the matter. Growing up here at Avontir, I, um, I was surrounded by horses, and um, you get a relationship and get, you pick up the vibe around them. Yeah, a horse, is a, as an individual, you know, they've all got their own traits. The mother's a little bit cooked, and so then you a good chance the child's going to be cooked. And if you put that mother with a stallion that's a little bit cooked, it's definitely going to be cooked, but, you know, you just work with it. Obviously, some that are kind, some that are gentle, some that are forward, and it, it goes through their, their families. Um, and that, as a breeder, you kind of pick that up. You know, so the stallion really is the backbone of your, of your stud farm. Every year, you, you've got your breeding season where you produce foals who become yearlings, which you then sell off at the sales. We keep our mares in that out because they really don't like being in stables. Like a lot of people say, well, why do you keep them out in the bad weather? And a lot of the times when you bring them in, they're so distressed, they weave and they box walk. They, it, honestly, it's so stressful for them. They're so much happier being outside with the herd. So, as you can see, they all look pretty relaxed. <laughs> being a girl in the industry, especially sort of the breeding side, with the stallions, it's not really a, a lady's job. So the more experience I can get under my belt with the stallions, the better. Just so relaxing out here. 
you're so eager to learn and grow here that it's just it's amazing. Fall is obviously from birth and then so they are full up until about six six months of age is when we typically wean them from weanling you get yearling so yearling is obviously year old so two years we, we start them at two years old so we introduce them to the lunging um lunging bridle saddle and eventually a rider and then after that you get, obviously get three four and so on that's pretty much your milestones Once a foal is born, your goal as a breeder is then to turn it into a racehorse. Um, you've got, from birth, you've got about a year and a half to prepare to become a sellable horse. Um, horses generally start racing in their two-year-old year. Uh, their three-year-old and four-year-old years are their prime time for racing. He's getting on now. He's almost 20, he'll be 20 years old this year, which is, you know, for us, it's actually a blessing that he's even made it to that age. I was uh, held the record for the fastest thousand metre time. You know, it's world record, which is quite impressive. These things are, they're close to me, you know. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of my happiness has come from them in the last few years. They really are special animals, and, you know. The relationship between a human and a horse is a, it's an incredibly special one. I, I don't know any other animal that can form a bond with it the human in such tight, you know, in touch of such a beautiful way. You know, with the jockeys and the horses, the bonds that they form, those are, those are powerful and they're pretty special. Not all jockeys love horses. It's a job. Lyle loves horses. Lyle's grown up in a yard. He's a part of a training family. It makes a huge difference, and he understands his animals. I truly believe that it's my love for the sport and the horses, um, and that is linked to being really dedicated and um, hardworking. So, you know, because I, I love the sport so much, it's not a job for me. I go out and do it because I love it. Um, I feel if more people knew exactly what goes into these horses going onto the track, they would be a lot more enthralled. Hi, Mr. Gray. No, pleasure. Oh, you're talking about today? Okay. All right, I see. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so um, one of the other jockeys, Samanga, got off today um, for family reasons. And um, now he's phoned me to pick up a ride that Samanga was riding. So I picked up another ride. I had four wins in the, out of the 30 rides in September. 17 out of 100 in October, and then I think November so far must be about, I'd say, 15 or so. Um, it's not updated, it's up until the 14th, so I've had a few winners since then, but it's just to keep track so we can know uh, where we are for the month, how well we're doing, and um, also gives us a perspective of everyone else. So it kind of gives that sort of um, competition, but in a good way, you know, not, not negative, just to drive each other. Yeah, like, I mean, if you just have a look here in the jockey room, you'll basically see that, you know, your older guys sort of have their lockers and stuff like that, which they've stuck with over the years, and that's where your kind of hierarchy will fall into place in the jockey room. The starting stalls before the races normally should be very quiet, but we, sometimes we, we get there and there's four minutes to go, so there's, there's quite a bit of banter. Um, I haven't been around the country of, of late, but in the Cape there's the guys have got a very good sense of humour, and you actually got to be careful what you say or what you do, because you will get tuned about it. <laughs> No three winners today. No three winners today. <laughs> jockeys we're all very close I mean we see each other every day we ride races together every day so most of us are together more than what we are with our own families so we become very close we form bonds with uh, each other and and yeah friends are formed but unfortunately the minute you walk out of the jockey room there is no friends because 
everyone wants to win the race. There is no, no friends outside of the jockey room. To be in this, uh, uh, an academy, it's like a boarding school. It's something that I've never experienced before. It was just the uh, first time being surrounded by different kind of guys. Being really dedicated and um, hard working. And um, because I love it, I'm, I'm working hard at it every day. So I'm really motivated and I enjoy every minute um, of racing. So the best way to train the apprentices with their aerobic fitness is to do high intensity interval training. So what that entails is they'll be on a treadmill, we'll have them hooked up to heart rate belts, um, and then we work their heart rate up mimicking race riding. So it might start from a walk, jog to a sprint, and then come back down. I love working with the boys, they um, are a delight to work with every day. They work really, really hard, um, and it's, it's really great to see young people strive for something in their lives. Being so, so dedicated um, and happy to do so because I love the sport, it does make it easier to, to be dieting. You know, that's just the one hard part. A lot of these young guys are young adolescents, still growing um, and maturing, so we need to be realistic with their goals. Our practice is to encourage regular healthy eating, adjusting the diets for each individual to best manage their weight, but avoiding missing meals and wasting and sweating, really just achieving very tight control of their weight within their goal weight. I get involved in the meal preparation and assisting the boys with making appropriate meal choices with each individual apprentice having slightly different requirements. When you get to the academy, you know, um, you're not used to the food, like the portions they give you. Like you're, you're so used to like, you go home whenever you want, you want to eat, you go to the fridge. In the academy, in your first day, LA, you can't just go to say, I'm hungry, I want food. So you have to wait like three times a day. You must know that's your meal for, for three times a day. You can't be snacking and all that. I just rode now that I ran second as my light ride. So I had to just like had a diet. I haven't had anything to eat or drink. Are you hungry? <laughs> I am quite hungry and thirsty right now keeping their weight as tightly controlled as possible is going to go a long way to determine how many rides they get um, and being healthy so that um, they can healthily manage that. If you don't eat a healthy diet, your body fat is likely to climb and that'll immediately push your weight out of its range and long-term health implications, which definitely would jeopardize their longevity. Horses, uh, generally everybody has their own diet for their own horses, but um, my dad was lucky enough to develop his own, his own racing feed, which we feed between eight to 10 kilograms. And you know, like, like you say, what you put in is what you get out. Some horses also, they don't enjoy cubes. So then you've got to put them onto a muesli, um, multi-grain type of food. Hi, I'm Adam Azzi, I'm 31 years old and I'm a racehorse trainer. The consistency, the consistency of your foods, it's a huge factor to how, the, how your horses will run. And if you're continually getting different types of feed, your horses, the results will show with your horses. You know, they'll run up and down, they won't run consistently well. It's an expensive hobby to, to have a horse in training. Um, firstly, you've got to have the right type of bedding for the horse to sleep on every night. The horse could be comfortable and so you can't skimp on, you can't skimp on anything. That is our, one of our mottos, um, try not to, to skimp on anything. and. Uh, the feed is of, high, of the highest quality, so that's expensive too. Probably one of the biggest expenses as a, as a trainer is your, your feed bill. Um, you know, so like you can see, there's, the feed rooms will always be full of food. You've got to find a balance with each horse, and every horse is an individual. Eh? Um, you could just, you'll get some horses that are terrible eaters, and then you've got to, and you want to try and get them fit, but the harder you work them, the less they're eating. So then you've got to try and get them to be happy so that they eat. And when horses are happy, they eat well. We've got such busy schedules. I, I travel around the country uh, with my racing, you know, to Durban or even Cape Town. In South Africa, we have some of the best jockeys in the world. We obviously friends with a lot of jockeys, but we're all fighting for the same thing. You have to be a serious athlete to be a jockey. A jockey has to be as fit or even more fit than a, any professional athlete. 
Our horses generally get around 75 kilometers an hour. It's a critical speed to be making decisions every split second. Jockeys don't have it easy, and normally the first guy that gets blamed when a horse doesn't perform well. Couldn't have hoped for a better day. I've had three winners, two seconds and a third, so everything in the money and all really good runs. I'm absolutely thrilled with the proceedings. Things went smoothly, horses ran well, can't complain. Um, I've come away unscathed from falls, um, but also at the same time, unfortunately, I, I've also picked up numerous injuries. Um, I fractured my right knee and um, actually just come back from that recently. I've had quite a few falls, quite a few breaks. First time you get back on horse, you, you do definitely think about it, but once you're on the track, you're going, you forget about it completely. Um, broken my collarbone, um, I've chipped my left knee, um, concussion, you know, these sort of things, they, they're part and parcel with the job, and um, some people might say jockeys are highly paid, but they must realize we're putting our lives at risk. I fell in, in Durban and on the poly track, doing MRI scan and picked up that this disc has gone into my spinal cord, and the doctor warned me that if I, if I get on horse or if I just fell down the stairs, I, I could be a quadriplegic. The doctor said to me, I, I might be able to come back and ride, or I might not be able to. So there was a bit of doubt in his mind, and it wasn't easy, but the day he gave me the, the heads up, um, I got back in, into training, and, and just training with him has got me reasonably fit back, back to, the, to where I am now in the saddle. In the blink of an eye, I was on the ground, and I just felt like a lot of pain on my, on my, on my knee, and I just didn't know, I didn't know what to do, to scream or cry. You're gonna have to operate. And I said, okay, cool, I didn't know what to say. And, uh, you know, that injury set me back because my leg, you know, your, your leg as a jockey, without your leg, you've got no career ahead of you. It was really tough. I thought, you know, I, couldn't, I will never come back. There was a lot of fluids, there was a lot of um, cuts of the bone. Once I healed, I went, I went straight back and from then everything just molded on. I was autopilot, back on, the, uh, back on the saddle. It's all about bouncing back if, if a fall does occur and um, remaining strong uh, physically and mentally. For me it was just a pleasure getting back on the horse and have no pain. And once I got back onto the horse, basically the confidence was there, it was just as per normal, it was just basically like getting on a bicycle and cracking on. So we're looking for a hip hike, a head nod, um, and yeah, horses are usually, as I say, well, uh, down on sound. So the leg that they go down on is basically to take most of the weight off the leg that they don't want to put weight on. So now this horse is basically settled down, and from what I can see, I'm happy. There's no severe head nod. Um, the horse trotting well for me, so I will let this horse run. Uh, if anything, it's on this. Yeah, for eh? Yeah. All right, it's out. Go ahead. Horse number 13 slipped my mind, uh, not running out in front. Then the squats is right. Came down short as well. Is that one? Yeah. Cool. I'm scratching horse number 13, slipped my mind, not striding out in front. Copy, thank you. Some horses do have a choppy canter, uh, but that's hence why we, we look at them at the start to make sure that there's no lameness issues. If they are lame, uh, we, will, we will scratch them and pull them out to race. So no lame horse will be racing. So we used it with that horse within, I would say, Opening gates it within a minute or two um, at the most. We're already with that horse and we're assisting the horse. All right, so this is basically now after the race. The horses will then come down the chute, depends on how many. They get unsaddled here. Uh, we will look for, for, for obviously any lamenesses and then horses that epistaxis, horses that cough, horses that cut, cut into, horses with speedy cuts. So any racing incidents or any racing injuries we will definitely have a look at, and uh, those horses will get treated accordingly. We are being proactive. We'd rather be, be out there 
anticipate something to happen than rather just wait for something to happen. Uh, I think it's a thrill that you, once you've had a winner or for the jocks ridden a winner or trained a winner, um, it's something hard to describe. So for new people in the, coming into the industry, I think it's a, it's a feeling you can't uh, get anywhere else. My horses um, and a lot, most of the trainers' horses are treated like royalty. A lot of people laugh at me because all my horses eat carrots, but <laughs> and not for race horses don't usually. But yeah, I, I do give my horses a lot of love, and um, it's quite nice when I have people that that have heard bad things about racing from the Christian world come into my yard and see they they're really blown away and um, they're really happy to see how wild the race horses are looked after. The racehorses are really, really well looked after. Um, obviously, horses that can take racing uh, in shorter spaces of time uh, do run more often. Um, but if a horse is slightly tired or uh, just a bit quiet after a race, we give them all the time in the world. But they get treated like kings and queens and uh, they get the best of everything. And uh, at the end of the day, the horses have to come first to, to get the results. Our horses are our business and if we've got an unhappy horse, if we've got a horse that's malnourished or which wouldn't be or has a problem, at the end of the day we've got we've got the obligation to get it going because that's our livelihood. So the wilder our horses are, the better we do, and a happy horse is a good horse. My dad used to train horses here since 1974 on this beach. And uh, he, he always believed that a happy horse is a good horse. The care and attention that the South African industry gives to their horses is massive. If you look at any horse that comes and competes on any track in South Africa, that horse is very well cared and looked after and loved. We're still here at Sunrise Beach in Musenberg in the Western Cape. It's a beautiful day and I'm here with the one, the only, our very own Miss South Africa and Miss Universe First Princess, Tamron Green, everybody. You're looking amazing, my love. Thank you very much. Nice to see you again. Look at us. I feel like an African princess. Well, actually, you are our African queen because you are representing us so well. So there's so much to draw from, the heritage, cultures, and you can see it in this design. They get time off, they get to go to, to the beach, um, and I think there's a lot more behind the scenes that people don't really understand. You know, racing is, is a passion, and in, in order for that to work, you need to have a passion for the horse, and that's first and foremost. One of the hardest parts is obviously keeping your trainers happy. Um, you're trying to always do your best and, and sometimes you, you get a knock or things don't go your way and um, you, you can't um, drop your lip over something like that. You've actually got to look at the positive outcomes, be optimistic on, on a run and um, you know, just take, go back to the drawing boards if you need to be and just work on to, to the next goal. It's just good to build a relationship with the jockey you use and um, you both will learn how to, um, you know, work with each other. You know, I might like to go to the front more often and other trainers might like to be dropped out more often and run their horses from the back. Um, so I think it also builds down to relationships and which builds down to communication and good information exchange between yourself and the jockey. 
you know, you, you always want to keep your trainers happy. And I think that's the hardest part because without them, we won't get the rides. And if you're not having winners, um, the, that sort of notion that you're out of form uh, can come across and your rides start thinning out. So as I mentioned previously, it's more about just being consistent um, stick to what you know, don't change things and um, keep riding winners. Their braveness and their attitude, because let me tell you, you wouldn't want to be sitting on 500 kilos in a tiny little steel box with 500 kilos on either side of you, ready to just explode. They're a little bit buzzy because they've suddenly started to do a bit of fast work. Come on, Dile. Ready to run? You know what, uh, she's still a little bit, a little bit soft, yeah. She hasn't been to the gates. But... Once she gets to that gate and she gets, yeah. and then she'll get that uh, yeah, uh, stance and then, yeah. Okay. But, uh, but it, by that time, she'll show you already when yeah. she's ready. It's basically the same way that you would train a human athlete. So we, seven days a week, we have two days where we do fast training work. So they would do sprints that you would do with humans. So you would either sprint up horses or you would work over a little bit of ground and you would do some harder fast work for basically two days of the week. The other three days of the week, we just basically do maintenance work, which is light cantering work or, or lighter work, the same as what you would go out for a run every day to keep yourself fit and, and keep yourself um, in good, uh, in peak fitness. Think of horse racing like golf. Whereas, you know, in racing, weaker horses and stronger horses are given merit ratings so that it can level the playing field. So stronger horses will carry more weight than what weaker horses will carry. And the same in golf, uh, whereas your better players will get less strokes than your worse players. This is, the, this is in place so that you can level up playing fields and that um, the weaker horses have more of an advantage and that, my friends, is how the handicapping system works. Graham is very competitive. Like in anything that he does, he always wants to win. Whether it's just playing a game of cards, he must win. And he gets stuck with himself if he loses, so there's a uh, very competitive oak over there. And he's off. Oh, he's given it every chance of giving himself a birdie. Straight at it, got enough legs. Oh, perfectly done. Perfection. I'm Alistair Cohen. I'm a horse racing commentator and Teletrack presenter. Gates open and they're racing. If I could fly, I got a horrible jump. Swift sailing was taken out. Philomena was the first one to break. To do run run shows a bit of pace and watch me now is towards the outside. I used to go down to the race with my dad and absolutely loved it from there. So I thought being a commentator would be such a cool job to get involved in. When I was 12 years old in uh, 2002, there was a commentator's competition to Clarewood. Won that. Took me a while to call my first live race, but in 2010, everything broke for me. Drive up that bar, that right. So you can commentary, yeah? Commentary is much easier than this sport, especially in this school. And, and Raymond? Six. And Diego, five. Raymond, six from there? Yeah, again. <laughs> What's happening, Raymond? So there's obviously a big push worldwide to stop use of the crop for jockeys and racers. Um, in any form of a question, in any discipline of a question, uh, you'll find that there's there's a crop at use. And I think in horse racing, the crops that the jockeys use are probably the, the least effective when it comes to, to harm. In fact, it doesn't harm at all. You could uh, take the crop and, and smack me with it and I don't think it'll, it'll have an effect. In fact, I've been hit with it before and not even a mark, it just makes a noise. And uh, I think over the last few decades, there's been a, a big push to, to stop you know, big leather welts that, that might have been around. Not anymore. I think that, uh, that's a misconception that we need to get rid of. I, I, they care immensely. I mean, I'm, I'm around horses daily, um, and I wouldn't be in it if I felt that they were being abused or, or that they were, weren't being taken care of more than any other animal. I think they're animals people first before they are race with trainers. They, they grew up loving the animal. Racing has had a lot of negative you know, aspects cast over it due to the nature of betting and the fixing of it. They're beautiful animals and they get looked after pretty well and it's actually an incredibly special sport. 
You know, it is frustrating to hear when the first perception is obviously about doping or otherwise about, um, you know, graft going on in races. And I don't think, uh, I don't think that happens. That is far from the truth. All of us go out there trying. We're trying to secure jobs, trying to make money. Uh, we're trying to make our names and we wouldn't put a de jeopardy for, for that sort of thing. And um, I think that people who have that sort of opinion um, maybe just don't know enough about racing or have watched too many movies that they could believe something like that. I'm not saying that people don't do those sorts of things because in, in, in all sorts of um, sports careers, people do those sorts of things, but it is illegal and we are not supposed to do it. And there are very strict uh, protocols in place to, to make sure that these things are kept in order. This day and age is a lot of movement towards, you know, environmentalism, sustainability, good humanitarian kind of those sort of aspects. And there's a lot, a lot of consciousness, awareness, social media, you can't get away with much these days. So it's been a great thing. And horses really do get looked after a lot better these days. They only get raced once a month or, you know, maybe sometimes twice a month in their peak of racing, but you know, they really don't get pushed too hard and you, you got to know their limits because you want to look after them for as long as possible. It's, it's very well governed and um, obviously uh, for, as far as I'm concerned, from my side, it's, it's, it's definitely a drug-free sport. People say like it's uh, gambling, but actually it's a bit of a science where you can actually find a winner by using the numbers. And 160, I'm going to set her up the match. She goes now, Benin for 160,000 and selling. A lot of people think it's just a big gamble. It's not. Yeah. Because you get people who like devote their lives to working out ratings and yeah. it's their jobs. You're going to get 500 now. At 500, you come all the way with me now, you're living your life. There's such a good vibe around more sales. It's the anticipation of getting the horse you want and seeing what the market is doing. So it's it's it's, it's hair raising, um, heartbreaking, and, and and it's got a lot of adrenaline packed into it. And there's a lot of downs, and so I, I like the sound of the hammer. And selling for two hundred thousand. But mostly the big sign of victory, because you feel like you have an opportunity at winning something big, and that's, that sign of opportunity is, is the sign of a hammer, and, and you, you being the, having the winning ticket, really, for me, is that's the best thing of the sale. There's a new way of, of marketing the sport and through owning and, and, and syndication, and it's not just about the events, which they do play a good part, but I think in, in retaining people to get to know the sport, you have to get them here more often, and I think um, that's sort of the barrier that racing has to work through. I don't think any money can buy that feeling of having a winner. Um, it's just something that you can't explain to anybody. And I think especially those people that do have a lot of money that are fairly wealthy people, that kind of feeling you don't get from just, there are not many things that can buy that feeling. And especially if you have a really good horse that can win a Met or a July or a, I mean, you can't buy that. A lot of opportunity in, 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 um, in trading and, and buying and selling horses in South Africa. You know, at the time I was unknown, no one knew who I was, and so I just wanted to be that, like a star, you know? I wanted to be uh, a champion jockey. Just wanted also to have a name. Things just started to fall in, 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 into place. He was the first black jockey ever to win the Vodacom Derby in July on a horse called Heavy Metal. Heavy Metal also gets into its absolute stampede. Jet Explorer, the last 100. Heavy Metal gets going. Heavy Metal and run for it. Heavy Metal with his head in front. Heavy Metal won it. We're on the inside, but it's the red cap of Sir Munga Kamalo. Sean Terry, they've done it again. I became the first black jockey to win the Devon July. So it was a hard work, and actually it was my first attempt in a, a, in a horse called Heavy Metal. He's bling. So his nickname is, they call him Bling, and, and he's just a, he's a great character, a very fine rider, um, very aerodynamic in the way in which he sits, which is quite unusual. 
coming from a location and all of a sudden being called the top jockey of uh, uh, South Africa. It's, it's, it's been an amazing journey. He's a very, very tough competitor, a very dedicated guy and a shining example to any of his counterparts um, who may have aspirations of making it one day. That Samanga's got the full package. That race really opened a lot of doors for me. Um, I even ended up getting a lot of uh, uh, offers overseas and, you know, I, I was offered to ride in China, I was offered to ride in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, I went to Mauritius and I went to, I went to uh, um, Australia and I went to England. All those places, if it wasn't for the Vodacom uh, Devon Chulai uh, winner, I don't think, uh, you know, they would have recognized me. I do have uh, things to achieve, and also I wanted to be a mentor for the young black guys, uh, young black jockeys who want to become uh, a professional jockeys. I had to keep improving to, to prove myself, and um, I believe I've jan done just that, and, you know, uh, a year and a bit later, I'm winning the South African Jockeys title, which is something I could never have dreamed of so early in my career. Big race day, and you know you're riding a horse with a chance. Yo, your heart start pounding, and you just start looking at your the, the other guys, the other jockeys. You're thinking to yourself, I need to put these guys in such a um, great feeling. The thrill of racing comes from winning. Um, you always want to remain positive and you don't want to be thinking of the worst and what could happen. You always hope for the best. Racing away from the 2,000 metres mark and a great rule to go with it. And Deo Juventus gave away three lengths. Cash time broke out well. Secret potion Fort Ember goes on the attack. Then further back, we find Arctic in the orange and green colours. Dawn Assault just behind the pace and the pace is good. Then comes Coral Fever, Tilbury Fort, it's Tilbury Fort. Tilbury Fort won it. Dawn Assault in a photo for second with Coral Fever, Cascopedia. Then came Laika Panther and Arctica. Young man Lyle Hewitson, what he has achieved today, this young man is living his dream and he's, he's achieved today what he may never achieve in one day again. I'm sure he'll have many great days to come, but this is a day that will stick out in my mind for young Lyle Hewitson. In terms of like achieving um, and what I'd like to do in 10 years time, um, you know, more South African titles, um, as hard as they are, I'd like to, to get another one on my, on my calendar. Um, and overseas stints, but not just to take part, but I'd like to succeed over, overseas as well and um, sort of build my, my name on the international stage. To be honest, um, the Summer Cup winner, Group 1, hasn't sunk in yet. I think um, it was such a fantastic day, that's still overwhelming. I was electrified and I was empty and I just didn't know, uh, was it me? Was it? I was just shocked actually, because the other horse on my inside it looked like it, uh, it, 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 came, it came for me. So it's just a, an amazing feeling. Tell me if it sounds a little sleazy. 